Good afternoon, uh, everyone. The meeting will now come to order. It is one o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, November 3rd, 2022. The theme of this quarterly meeting is Unlocking America's Democratic Potential by Reducing Inequality in the Classroom. The Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys. It is a public meeting and the live broadcast is on YouTube through the National Press Club. I want to welcome our new staff director, Mr. Mark Spencer. Uh, this is his first meeting and I had the opportunity to host him in Miami on uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, when we he witnessed the police and youth conference here in Miami-Dade County at the Dolphin uh, Stadium with the Miami Dolphins, the police departments of Miami-Dade County and young boys, high school boys from the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence Project. It was almost a thousand in attendance and uh, we were so happy to host uh, Mr. Spencer at that time. So I'm looking forward to working with him. I want to also extend a warm welcome to the commissioners, the staff of the US Commission on Civil Rights and the members of the Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys. We call ourselves commissioners and also to our public audience. Today, in keeping with the overall objective of the Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys, we aim to exchange ideas and identify policies for empowering Black males to both prosper and participate in public life more fully. This is our best strategy for strengthening American democracy. As I have said in previous meetings, this commission rejects the politics of division. Our goal is to create healthy and equitable communities where everyone is afforded the opportunity to thrive. And I want to say our goal is to create healthy and equitable communities where black men and boys are afforded the opportunity to thrive because our commission has given us the actual permission to speak of black men and boys. Never in this nation has any agency been afforded the opportunity to address the population that we have been afforded to address. And it's a privilege, it's a privilege. And I have been in this work for 30 years. So it's a privilege to be able to say black men and boys without even thinking about it. With the World Series in full swing, it only seems appropriate to use a baseball metaphor and assert that the commission seeks to ensure that everyone gets their turn in the batter's box. And that includes black men and boys. We began our work in January and we deemed the year 2022, 2023 as the year of black men and boys. We want our black boys to have access to internships, corporate internships, access to higher education and access to apprenticeships. We know that all black boys are not going to go to college. So we must afford them opportunities that will give them a piece of the pie in America without having to have a college education. I fought so hard for free community college because here in Miami, we have something at our community college called Rising 
Black scholars. And it's a two year degree, an AA degree that's free for all of the Black boys in our community. And I'm so proud to have helped our community college begin something so earth shattering. And there are so many opportunities at community colleges that uh, young people can achieve uh, um, um, a great education and a, a great uh, future at a cute community college. We also need to expose our children to Job Corps. I call Job Corps the best kept secret in the federal government. And I want all of our school children and all of our communities, especially black boys and men to know the secrets of Job Corps and how Job Corps can put them on the right track. I also want to expose our boys to Close Up. Close Up is a trip to Washington, DC. If I had a magic wand, I would wave it and say that every black boy in America from the time of first grade to 12th grade, they would get an opportunity to have a get a trip to Washington to observe the political process and to visit all of the statues and learn about the founding of our nation and how black slaves built the capital. Black male slaves built Washington. And every time I cross the street from my office to the Capitol, I look up at steeple and I know how many black men fell to their deaths installing the steeple on the top of the Capitol. And I think that our black boys across the nation need to know how the Capitol and the Washington DC was built. So I believe in exposure. I believe that we should take our children out of the inner cities where they live. Some people call them ghettos and expose them to every uh, wonderful opportunity that we can afford as a nation. I know that in the summertime, our little black boys are in the front yard of their grandmother's house playing in the dirt and other children are skiing in Aspen. And then they have to return to school and take the same identical high stakes test. And they are expected to make the same score. And we know that that's not going to happen. So that is, those are some of the things that we need to um, help our children uh, pass through as they become uh, a man from a black boy to a man. And because all of these tickets that we're discussing will interrupt the school to prison pipeline. We have to uh, deflate some of the tension that exists between police and youth because that tension is there. And we know that our young boys have tempers, quick tempers, and they don't understand how to deal with the police. So we have to teach them how to deal with the police and we need to teach them how to do, uh, police how to deal with our youth. I want to thank and welcome our guest speakers and thank them so much for uh, being with us today and sharing their expertise and their time. I want to welcome Dr. Gregory Hutchinson, Jr. Hutchings, Jr., Dr. Glenda Prime, Kathy Hollowell, Dr. James Revan, Dr. James Henry Harris. Thank you so much. And also Dr. Walter Fluker, who will moderate for us. So thank you for being a part of us.
and thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with the country today regarding black men and boys. Thank you for those wonderful opening remarks, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm going to step in and take it the baton from you uh, and introduce myself. My name is Mark Spencer. And as the chairwoman said, I'm the new uh, director of the US Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys. The commission is the result of the singular vision of Representative Frederico Wilson of the 24th of Florida, which includes parts of Miami and Dade County. And in 2020, she brought her vision into reality for the first time in the history of the United States, creating a commission, as she said, focused entirely on the uplift and the well being of Black boys and men. This grew out of her vision, which has grown in 30 years to be realized as the 5,000 uh, mentors of excellence, which I just in the past two days had the privilege of of being present uh, for the annual forum, uh, building relationships and teaching between uh, law enforcement and youth, particularly black boys, but not only black boys, Latin boys and others. And I can tell you that of the thousand young men that I saw, there still are another 2000 that will be participating in other forums uh, very shortly. Having said that, and again, thanking the chairwoman for her singular vision, passion and dedication to this subject. Uh, today, we are conducting our first quarterly meeting for the fiscal year of 2023. And Madam Chair, esteemed commissioners, uh, welcome one and all and the public uh, to this quarterly meeting, the theme of which is unlocking America's democratic potential by reducing inequality in the classroom. I recently finished an outstanding biography of Frederick Douglass written by author David Blight uh, called Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. And most importantly, Mr. Blight chronicles how Douglass talked about the liberating aspect of how literacy, learning to read as a slave in colonial and post-colonial Maryland brought him out of the darkness of slavery into the light of learning. And over the time since the demise of formal slavery in this country, the light of learning and the light of literacy continue to be the keys to unlocking bright futures for all of our black men and boys. That remains unchanged. And we are in this effort challenging the nation to do better in terms of creating universal opportunity to gain from the light of learning for all black men and boys so that they can become fully engaged, full-fledged citizens, and also to raise our democracy, which we all know at present is under serious threat. I'm thrilled to say that we have gathered here today to begin to address this situation about improving our democracy through the empowerment and learning of black boys and men. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists who will help us shine a light on that path forward to achieving greater democracy and greater opportunity. Um, we'll hear from first, uh, Dr. Gregory Hutchings Jr. He's the founder and chief executive of Revolutionary ED LLC. He is a nationally recognized educational leader and anti-racism activist and published author who unapologetically advocates for black, indigenous and people of color and racial equity in education. Dr. Hutchings was also recently appointed as the first executive in residence at American University School of Education 
and plays a key role in elevating the school's anti-racist administration, supervision, and leadership certificate program. Dr. Hutchins has over 20 years of combined educational experience as a college admissions counselor, teacher, school principal, central office administrator, superintendent, and college professor. He specializes, again, in anti-racism education. Dr. Hutchings' life's work is educational leadership and dismantling systemic racism in schools across America. Dr. Hutchings earned his doctorate in educational policy, planning, and leadership from the College of William and Mary. He currently serves on numerous national boards and is a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Dr. Hutchings is a native of Alexandria, Virginia, and he is a proud husband and father, wife Cheryl, and proud parents of two children. After we hear from Dr. Hutchings, we will be blessed by uh, a presentation from Dr. Glenda Prime, who currently serves as the Dean of the School of Education and Urban Studies at Morgan State University. Prior to her current appointment, she served for 10 years as the Chair of the Department of Advanced Studies, Leadership and Policy, also in the School of Education and Urban Studies a department which houses five doctoral and four master's programs in various fields of education. A science educator by training, Dr. Prime holds the PhD in science education from the University of the West Indies. And she has told me that she is a proud Trinidadian. Prior to her administrative roles, Dr. Prime had 25 years of teaching experience in the graduate education of science teachers and researchers. Her publications include numerous articles and book chapters on science and technology education uh, and on doctoral education. Her most recent work is an edited volume of the teaching of STEM to African-American learners in which she advances the notion of race visible pedagogy, an approach that centers on racialized experiences of African-American learners and their education in STEM. After we hear from Dean Prime, uh, we will transition to uh, a local hero uh, who is Kathy Hollowell Makel, director of the District of Columbia Association for the Education of Young Children. And Ms. Make Hollowell Makel will talk about how she has, and through her organization, been able to influence creating uplifted standards for early childhood education um, and uh, early childhood wellness for that population of children zero to five, focusing on children of color, black children and boys in particular, um, and also the underrepresented and uh, I should say uh, horror uh, economic communities within the District of Columbia. We will, in the first portion of our communal discussion with a presentation uh, by the Reverend Dr. James Henry Harris. And Dr. Harris is the Distinguished Professor of Preaching and Senior Research Scholar in Religion and Humanities at Virginia Union University and pastor of the Second Baptist Church, Idlewood Avenue, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. He holds graduate degrees from the University of Virginia in theology uh, in ethics. I'm sorry. He holds graduate degrees from the University of Virginia in theology, ethics, and culture uh, from Virginia Commonwealth University in English literature and earned both the master's in philosophy and the PhD degree from Old Dominion University along with the Doctor of Ministry degree from the United Theological Seminary as a Sam Proctor Charles Booth Fellow. Dr. Harris is author of 10 books, including Pastoral Theology, Preaching Liberation, The World Made Plain, and his latest book, No Longer Bound, A Theology of Reading and Preaching. 
And I also will add, he has two more recent publications, um, Black Suffering, Silent Pain, Hidden Hope, uh, and his experience in academia with the N-word. Uh, his love and compassion for the preacher and the church is seen in his relationship with youth and young adults throughout the community. He is a former president uh, of all preaching teachers in North America and Canada and lectures, and he preaches around the country in the area of expository and textual preaching. He tries to blend together the church and the academy uh, and theory and practice. His goal is to preach in demonstration of the spirit and of power, as Paul says to the church at Corinth. Dr. James Henry Harris is married to the Reverend Demetrius Harris, and they are parents of two sons, James Corey and Cameron Christopher. Uh, just a second. Uh, and I want to make sure that I include the fact uh, that Professor Harris also is a divinity of ministry in black church studies and a PhD in urban studies, uh, educational leadership and policy analysis. Uh, and so we're just so pleased to have him as well. Um, after we hear our four distinguished uh, presenters and panelists, we will have a round table moderated by uh, Dr. Walter Earl Fluker. And Walter Earl Fluker is Professor Emeritus of Ethical Leadership at Boston University and Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics, and Leadership at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. He was born in Vaden, Mississippi, and raised in Chicago, Illinois, where he attended public schools. He served the United States Army as chaplain's assistant from 1971 to 73. He received a BA degree in philosophy and biblical studies from Trinity College in 1977, and a Master's of Divinity degree in 1980 from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, Dr. Fluker completed his PhD in social ethics at Boston University in 1988. He retired from the Boston University School of Theology in June of 2020. Dr. Fluker has a well spring of other um, awards and teaching posts and distinguished uh, speaking opportunities. And we will hear uh, from him. And I wanna highlight uh, his international work in 2004 Dr. Fluker served as distinguished lecturer in the International Human Rights Exchange Program and visiting professor at the University of Cape Town, graduate school of business, and from 2008, 2011, as faculty at the Salzburg Global Seminar in Salzburg, Austria. Dr. Fluker was a distinguished lecturer at the US Embassy in Abuja and Lagos, Nigeria, Cape Town, Pretoria, and Durban, South Africa. China and India. He served visiting professorships at the Harvard Divinity School, Candler School of Theology, and visiting scholar at Princeton Theological Seminary and Columbia Theological Seminary. And we are so glad uh, to have uh, Dr. Fluger moderate our conversation today. Now, uh, with your permission, Madam Chairwoman, uh, we'll uh, take the um, Roll call, if you are ready. I'm ready. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a second, please. Madam Chair, with your permission, um, per our enabling legislation, uh, a majority of the members of the commission, which is 10, constitutes a quorum. Uh, to establish the quorum, I will call each member by name. And for commissioners, please note your presence by saying here. Uh, Chairwoman Frederica Wilson. Here. Secretary Sharpton. Commissioner Beatty. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Bowman. Commissioner Brewer. Commissioner Caesar. Here. Commissioner, oh, thank you. Commissioner Clark. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Colclaw. 
Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dillard. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Elder. Commissioner Elder. Commissioner Foster. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Martin. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Jeffries. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Marshall. Present. Thank you. Commissioner McBath. Commissioner McIver. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Oleka. Here. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, by my count, we have a quorum and I recommend that we proceed uh, with our program today. Oh, I'm, so uh, just uh, for the benefit of the proceedings, I know that the chairwoman uh, had to step away uh, for a moment. And so I will uh, carry on her duties and uh, ask now if we would hear from uh, Dr. Gregory Hutchings, Jr. Dr. Hutchings? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you all for this opportunity. I just want to, you know, start off uh, by thanking the Madam Chair for having this discussion and just for the U.S. Commission for even considering to focus on Black men and boys. Um, if you can go to the next slide, I, I like to center uh, my presentations when I'm talking to folks around my why. And um, this is near and dear to my heart because I, I talk about me and my brother, because as I served as the superintendent of Alexandria City Public Schools, um, just a couple of months ago, that uh, was my last day, my brother was right down the street in Alexandria City Jail. And he was waiting for his sentencing for a federal crime uh, that he committed and he has been sentenced since. But I start with him because we have the same parents, we have very similar adverse childhood experiences, and we were put through the same schools. And I asked my brother the first time that he was incarcerated, you know, what was the difference between my walk and your walk? And the one thing that he shared with me that was different was the fact that I had educators in my life from the time I was in kindergarten until I graduated from high school who believed and instilled in me and told me that I can be somebody. And he recalled the time when he was in sixth grade that his teacher told him that he was not going to mount to anything. Right. So my job as I move forward throughout my life is to make sure that we don't have other people experiencing what my brother had to experience, because now, you know, he has to fix his life, which I know he will. Right. I know that he will get back on track, um, but it didn't have to be this way. 
So we have to understand the power of education. So I'd like to start with that to get into these four specific areas. And we can go to the next slide um, that I wanna share with the commission. The first specific area is dealing with opportunities. And uh, you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry, is dealing with opportunities. And right now we have a serious opportunity to, uh, to make a difference for our black male learners across this nation. You know, we all know that race is a social construct that was created to make black and brown people inferior to the white race, right? Though that is, that is research, that's not just my opinion, right? We also know that there has been a racial reckoning in America for over 400 years. And what we have to do at this particular time is we have to take advantage of this moment where we are seeing the murder of black men across this nation. And we're seeing that black men's needs are not being met, whether it's in schools or in the workplace or just in America in general on multiple levels. And this is an opportunity for the commission to really take advantage um, of this particular time in life. And if you go to the next slide, I wanna run through just a couple of things in regards to our opportunity. And then I'm gonna get into where we need to focus um, and some other areas. So you can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to start with, uh, you all know the late and great uh, honorable Congressman John Lewis. You know, he talked about the importance of us in America getting into good trouble. And he always talked about how it was necessary trouble and how it could help us to redeem the soul of America. And that has resonated with me from the time I heard that quote. Um, it led me to write my book, which was getting into good trouble at school, right? If I'm going to get into some trouble and we're talking about education, I'm going to have to get in trouble at school. And I want to talk a little bit about some steps that I know the commission, as well as school systems across this nation can do to help our Black male learners. So if you can go to the next slide. I want to start with, um, in the next slide, please, I want to start with knowing your history. And I think that, you know, as we heard from our, our Madam Chair today, and she talked about some of the historical um, facts in regards to how the Capitol was built by Black men, right? When we teach our history, right, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that will allow us to rewrite our future. Because what happens in America is that time repeats itself, history repeats itself. And it's because people aren't familiar with it. So folks are using same tactics that have been used for many years. And if you don't understand that storyline, then it's hard for you to have a rebuttal or a counter narrative to what is being shared uh, with us. So we have to begin with knowing our history. The second thing, and you can go to the next slide, is focusing on a commitment to racial equity and not just equity, but racial equity. When we're talking about serving the needs of our black male learners. And you know, I love the fact that this commission is focused on black men and boys. We have to make sure we're calling out specifics in regards to race. It makes people uncomfortable, but many people does not, do not have the right to be comfortable. So we have to lean into our discomfort and we have to make sure that we are supporting and pushing people to be uh, to, to be in, to, to, to go into their discomfort um, space so that they can grow and that they can learn so that our black male learners uh, can achieve. Our next slide. Next, you know, in regards to our opportunity is just making sure that we are finding ways to dismantle de facto segregation. And we know this happens in school systems across this nation from TAD programs, magnet programs, programs that require some form of prerequisites or recommendations that are required in order to be in a particular course, whether it's advanced placement or an honors program, right? We have to make sure that we are dismantling those de facto segregation practices because what it is doing, it is dividing our Black students as well as their white counterparts. So we have to ensure that we are identifying some of these challenges within our schools and that we're being bold enough to really push the envelope and to dismantle that. Next slide. A specifically um, opportunity for us is to really think about the fact that we have discipline versus policing, right? We have to make sure that in our schools, we are not setting up structures 
where our young people are treated as if they are prisoners. I recall visiting a school, a charter school, and the principal was excited that the black students were walking down the halls with their hands behind their backs, looking to the floor. And he was saying, look how quiet our students are. And that was a celebration for him. And I said, I was appalled. I was appalled at the fact that these young black kids, one, are walking with their hands in their backs, but that they're looking down on the floor and in line and quiet, and you're praising them for that. That's the same thing that we're doing to prisoners in school. So we're setting up that pipeline to prison with these practices and thinking that's okay. Kids should be able to look up. Kids should be able to explore. Kids should be able to give some free range so they can learn self-control and how do you act in a public space, but not being mild and meek. You know, you mirror that to how we were treated when we were slaves, right? Those are the same kind of strategies that were used to keep us quote unquote tamed. And we have to get that out of our schools and our school systems across this nation. The next slide is dealing with the strategic thinking and strategic planning. You know, many school systems have strategic plans, but many are not strategic think or strategically thinking their way to achieve these goals and their plans. Right. We have to make sure we're being methodical and we're being extremely strategic in our approaches uh, to serving the needs of our students. I say strategic thinking is a skill, strategic planning. That is the resource or the roadmap to get you to wherever you're trying to go as an organization. And then the other opportunity that we have for the commission is really, you can go to the next slide, is having courageous and bold leadership. Right. It does require for us to really be courageous and bold when we are trying to do this work um, for, for black male learners across America, right? We have, we, or we continue, I know I do, I stand on the shoulders of so many black people like the late and great Honorable John Lewis. And I think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, I think of people who have paved the way even in the present, Right. Think of our president, our former president, my forever president, uh, President Obama, you know, who has been able to start things, you know, like my brother's keeper. Right. That focused on black male learners. Think of Congresswoman Wilson, who has started 5000 roles, um, role models of excellence. I mean, that is a phenomenal program that is now national in ensuring that our black male learners have the supports and representation so that they can be successful. And next, I want to go into um, why this we need to have a focus, um, not just, you know, we have these opportunities, but we really need to have an educational focus. And I'm asking the commission to focus specifically on prenatal to post-secondary. And specifically, what I want us to be able to do is to ensure that we provide the necessary resources for our families as before the child is even born to make sure that they have the appropriate care so that they can have the brain development that they're gonna to need to be successful when they get into a classroom. And so that we are not putting our black male learners into an environment where they are literally already behind everyone else around them, meaning their white counterparts in particular. We need to make sure that at the middle grades level that we are focusing on social, emotional, and academic learning. Right, math and English, they're very important. Science and social studies, don't get me wrong, they're important too. But the social and emotional health of our young black males is just as important. And we cannot wait until they are in a crisis to provide those services. These are things that we should be doing consistently throughout our time. And then we also need to focus on um, our secondary and our post-secondary education. I heard our Madam Chair uh, Wilson talk about the fact that we need to have workforce development and the program that was in Florida for an associate's degree while these young black males were in high school, right? We need to make sure that we have structures that are set up to set these black males for success, right? We need to make sure that they have the foundational skills so if they are put into these extracurricular or career technical education programs that they have those skills to be able to thrive and to be successful. So I'm asking the commission to make that a commitment. Let's go to the next slide. And um, let's talk about, uh, in specifics, a model or an example of what our Black males deserve. Um, for example, a young Black male should be able to walk into a school where there is representation, not just by the educators who are in that space, 
but also by the literature that they are reading, the posters that are on the walls, the names that are being used um, in their classrooms. It really does matter. You know, I go back to the story of me and my brother. I was fortunate to have Black women um, who were teachers of mine in kindergarten with Miss Murphy and second grade with Miss Lewis and sixth grade with Miss Johnson in high school when I had, you know, Miss Barnwell who said, you're going to go to Old Dominion University. And I didn't know why, but it's because that was her alma mater, right? And that's where I ended up going undergrad, you know, to school and getting a scholarship. We need to make sure that we have people who can understand the walks and of these young Black males' lives. And that is going to be so important um, and key. And then we also need to make sure that we are focusing on having these structures so that these young men can have the mentorship like 5,000 role models or mentorship like in Oakland where they have an African-American male initiative that focuses specifically on African-American males um, in schools. We need to ensure that this is happening at all of our schools across America. And the next slide, and I wanna finally talk about um, action and where the commission can go. Uh, and there's 11 specific things. Um, I'm gonna go quickly because I know we only have 18 minutes and I'm looking at my time. Um, so I wanna make sure that you all as a commission that you're walking away with some tangible action steps that can be taken across this nation that can make a difference, You know, not only for our black male learners, but for young people across the entire nation. And we can go to the next slide. You know, I already touched on the fact that it is gonna be important for all of us to ensure that we are um, making sure that we are removing those barriers in regards to technology. Um, and I have to say this, during the pandemic, we think back when we shut down all of our schools, right? And we shut down all of our businesses and the government was able to come up with dollars to provide broadband, to provide technology um, devices for students, to have buses that had access to the internet in communities that, that didn't have internet. And we were able to do that in one of the, the greatest crises um, in our time, right? So that needs to be mandatory moving forward because our black male learners and many of them who live in some of these urban or rural communities may not have access to broadband, may not have access to some of these technology resources. What the commission can do is really advocate to ensure that all children and that all families have access to the internet. That really is a lifeline um, to our success and to their success. We need to make sure that we have universal pre-K this is a total, you know, we talk about it all the time. We funded, you know, a pandemic for schools. We provided ESSER funds for schools across this nation. We can provide universal preschool and not just any type of preschool, but a preschool that includes play, that includes opportunities for parental resources and um, opportunities for families to be engaged in their child's learning. Um, and that should be mandatory. The same way every child goes to kindergarten, every child needs to go to preschool. Um, and that's the only way we're gonna see a difference. Go to the next slide, because I can't go through every single one of these. Um, but I also wanna make sure that we are focused on the social, emotional, and academic learning piece. And I said this before, we need to have social workers, counselors, psychologists in our schools. You know, we need to make sure, and it's not even just for our students, our staff in schools have been impacted. They have dealt with a significant trauma. You know, everybody is right now. So it will behoove us to ensure that we have quality resources that impact social, emotional, and academic learning for all of our um, students, not just our black males. And I think another most important piece is financial literacy. We talk about our economy, we want it to grow. We want to see our black male families or our black families across this nation to have that generational wealth. It is gonna be important for us to start at an early age to provide that financial literacy. So our black males, they can become black men who understand the, 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 the um, dollar, right? Who understand how do you contribute to this economy? Who understands what savings is all about? To understand that you need to own a piece of America, right? But when you own a piece of America, that there are things that you can also do to have that generational wealth for generations to come, right? So it's not just providing you the financial resources for your time, but also for your children and your children's children and their children that you don't even know about. 
And you can go to the next slide. And finally, I just want to talk about the fact that we need to make sure that we are providing, um, you know, developmental initiatives that relate to fatherhood initiatives, right? For our young Black men to grow up to be good fathers, we have to make sure that early on we are providing those skills. We're giving them access to the importance of being strong Black men in our Black families so that they can know what it takes to be a good Black father. And when we do that, I know that we will be able to achieve. And I'm going to stop here. I see that Mr. Spencer has come on. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. You can go to the next slide because I'm going to end with just this final quote from a woman that, next slide, from a woman that I, right here, that I strongly admire. Her name, in addition to Congresswoman uh, Wilson, but her name is Mary Frances uh, Winters. And she wrote the book called Black Fatigue. And the reason why this book resonates with me is because it gave me language for all this work that we're trying to do for Black males. It is tiring and it is exhausting and it is fatiguing, right? And it is important for us to build professional capacity so that we are able to endure this very tough road that we all are going to have to go down in order to provide an equitable education for our Black male learners in America. So thank you. Well, Dr. Hutchings, you know, as I told you, uh, after you uh, enlightened us with your executive uh, report for the committee, uh, just outstanding, really dynamite stuff. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the interaction of our very distinguished panel talking about these issues. And so once again, thank you for your contribution. Don't go anywhere, hold on. Uh, I won't, I'll be here. Plug you back in. Um, and next we'll hear uh, from uh, the outstanding Dean Glenda Prime of uh, the famous Baltimore University, Morgan State University, Dr. Prime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Spencer. And I have to begin by apologizing for the fact that I don't have my presentation, my slide presentation. I didn't realize that it had to have come to you much sooner. Um, I thought I would be able to share my screen right Dean, now, but that's okay. No, no, no problems. We are going to share that uh, with the commissioners uh, after we conclude the event. So don't worry. Okay, thank you. thank you. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address this important commission. I want to thank Congresswoman Wilson for her foresight in bringing this commission into being. And I want to thank you, Mr. Spencer, also for recognizing the essential overlap that exists between the work of an initiative that's currently ongoing at Morgan and the work of the commission. I am hopeful that the establishment of this commission it signals the recognition at the highest levels of government that our nation is in peril unless we are able to ensure that all sectors of our population have the opportunity to realize their fullest potential. And not just providing the opportunity, but also dismantling those systems which currently debar some uh, some sections of our population, particularly black men and boys, from full participation in national life and from fully uh, providing their contribution, making their contribution to the growth of this nation and to our democracy. It is clear to me that education is critical to all of this. And the fact that black men and boys are not experiencing the opportunity to express their full potential, in my view, implicates an education system. It means we are not doing all that we should or we are not doing some things right. And so I think the work of this commission is extremely important. And I want to begin, uh, what I want to do with this presentation is really to uh, share with you a concept that we've developed here at Morgan State University and which predated my knowledge of the work of the commission, but I 
uh, invited Mr. Spencer and he immediately saw the great, the great deal of overlap that exists between the work of the center and the work of the commission. So I want to begin by sharing with you the concept for the center and then explore with you some of the areas, possibly areas of overlap between the work of the center and the work of the commission. Um, Morgan State University, I'm proud to say, has been designated as a national treasure. But more than that, it has been designated by Governor Hogan as the preeminent uh, public urban research university for the state of Maryland. And in keeping with that designation, we are seeking to become an anchor institution for the state of for the city of Baltimore and, and the state of Maryland. And what that means is that in our research, in all of our teaching, in our activities, we focus on an amelioration of urban problems and address the conditions of the predominantly minority folk who live in urban settings. And in that context, the School of Education and Urban Studies has conceptualized a center for the elimination of educational disparities. The acronym is NSEED. National Center for the Elimination of Educational Disparities. And the center um, is, is focused on two things, transforming the conversation around equity and transforming the culture. So we say reframing the conversation and transforming the culture. And what I mean by that is that currently the concept of equity seems focused on test scores, standardized test scores. And we know that that is not the whole story. And we need to reframe that conversation because that focus on test scores positions some subpopulations, including black men and boys, and I might say particularly black men and boys as being deficient in some way. And when you think about equity in terms of test scores, attempts to correct it, focus on getting the test scores up and closing the so-called achievement gaps. And that fosters a deficit narrative. Something is wrong with some subgroups of the population. Something is wrong with black men and boys and we gotta fix it. Rather than attempting to fix the system that is creating the inequities. And so we are focused on reframing that conversation and on transforming the culture. Now the center was launched just a month ago. And so we are still in the process of conceptualizing its work and on seeking, continuing to seek funding to support the work of the center. The mission of the center is to alter the trajectories of African-American, Hispanic and low-income children in public schools in Maryland and across the United States from underachievement, low attendance rates, high dropout rates, inadequate preparation for college and career, to one in which they have the opportunity to achieve their full potential regardless of zip code and socioeconomic status. And the center is going to achieve its mission through this work around uh, reframing the conversation and work on, in research and design of interventions that will transform the culture. This, this, the, the need for the center is premised on a couple of things. One is the test score gap. Now we know that there is that test score gap. And even though we say that's not the whole story around equity, we do want our black men and boys, we do want all children to be able to read and do mathematics. So we have to work on, on, on those areas as well. Most recent NAEP data show persistent racial gaps. In the fourth grade, the math gap is 25 points. The math gap for black kids is 25 points below white kids and 18 points below between whites and Hispanics. The gap in math is 36 points between Asian Pacific Islander students and black students. And the math gap 
keeps widening as students progress through the grades. The second premise of the, of the center is the social and economic imperative. The US Bureau of Labor tells us clearly that income and employment correlate with educational attainment. And if we continue to ignore some sections of the population whose income earning power is diminished, we're going to have a serious social and economic problem. And you know, um, in 2017, reflection, reflecting on the 63rd anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education, John B. King, who was president and CEO of the Education Trust, described education as the civil rights issue of our time. Access to literacy as a gateway to mathematics, social studies, and literacy arts is a critical social justice issue. And the, the next why for the center is that it fits so well with alignment with the blueprint for Maryland's future. And that blueprint is premised on the fact that elevating the overall student performance to be among the world's best and best school systems, eliminating achievement and opportunity gaps between students from different family incomes, races, ethnicities, abilities, and disabilities. It should not be the case that children's school attainment, children's performance in school correlates with zip code. That is just not acceptable. It should not correlate with parents' socioeconomic status. And so these things underlie the premise behind the the development of NC, the National Center for the Elimination of Educational Disparities. And the work of the center is going to focus on what we are calling six pillars. The first is family student, we're calling it family student and teacher academic resilience. What we're saying here is that student achievement is not only dependent on what happens in schools, the family and the community and the school must be working in tandem to promote student achievement. And so we want to engage in work that helps communities to support children and teaches Black parents how to advocate for their children, how to understand the school system and not to be intimidated by schooling. Um, so the first pillar is family, student, and teacher academic resilience. And then our second pillar is urban teachers and leaders. And we are asking, what knowledge do we need to impart to teachers and school leaders to ensure that all children have an equal opportunity to learn? You know, um, one, one researcher has referred to racism in the schools by saying that it floats between the lines of the curriculum. And, and so in subtle ways, black children get told that they're not just not quite as good. They're not able to achieve. Um, Dr. Hutchins talked about his why. I'll tell you right now what my why is. I have three grandsons and the oldest of them, when he was seven years old, said to me one day, is it better to be white? And that cut like a dagger to my heart, that this seven-year-old, beautiful, strong, bright seven-year-old black child is already beginning to feel that he is less than and asking the question, is it better to be white? That's what keeps me focused on this work. And then the, th the third pillar is curriculum and pedagogy. How might the curriculum and pedagogical practices across the curriculum be better aligned for diverse learners? In my recent work with some colleagues here at Morgan, we have advanced the notion of race visible pedagogy. And what we are arguing there is that the racialized experiences of children must be made central to their learning. They must learn the his, their history. They must learn the, their 
their out of school lives must be seen as assets upon which to build learning. And so we are, we are trying to build out this notion of what a race visible pedagogy looks like. And then the other, the fourth pillar is cultural proficiency. How do we help teachers to understand the cultural, uh, the cultural capital that black children bring into the classroom? And then there's literacy. We have been focused a lot on literacy at Morgan. We, we, we have considerable expertise in the School of Education on promotion of literacy. We have a program that, that we are calling the Literacy Brigade, and we're bringing that under the umbrella of NSEED. And finally, social, emotional, and psychological well-being, which Dr. Hutchins, uh, Hutchings alluded to as being extremely important if we are to lift Black men and boys, all children, in fact, all disadvantaged children, um, out of the, the, the feeling that they are less than. And so that's the framework in a nutshell for NC. What I want to talk about now is what are, what's the case for intervention for black men and boys? And perhaps I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want to say a little bit about how we are seeing this as overlapping with the work of NC. Without a doubt, the biggest problem in education is one of inequity. All children just do not have the same opportunity to attain their potential. And black boys are at the greatest risk of negative social outcomes. At this point, as we address this problem, we are hindered in our fullest understanding because the NAEP data on school achievement does not disaggregate by gender. But here's what we do know. We know that all children suffered learning losses as a result of the pandemic. The scores show declines in reading and math scores in almost all states. We know that children in high poverty schools suffered the greatest losses for some of the reasons, again, mentioned by Dr. Hutchins, the inability to access the internet, the lack of technology in their homes. So <laughs> if, Children in high poverty schools suffered the greatest loss. And those are the schools to which the largest percentage of black boys attend. We know that they are the ones who suffered the most in terms of pandemic learning losses. We know that that's very likely the case. The percentage of black boys in grades three to eight who were proficient in math hovers around 15%. With respect to graduation rates, boys under, underperform girls by approximately 15%. Suspension and other exclusionary discipline rates for black boys exceeds that of their white male counterparts. I have some Baltimore County data that says at elementary level, black boys are suspended at 1.9 percentage points higher in terms of suspension and other forms of exclusionary practice. At middle school, that gets the nap to 10.9%. So as the boys get older, they are more subject to exclusion and, sus and, and suspension. There's, a, there's what I'm calling a race gap between teachers and students. Right now, almost 40% of children in American schools are children of color. But the teaching force is 80% white and female. So there, there is that, what I'm calling a race gap. What that means is that very often, black children go through their entire schooling and black boys particularly, because there's also a gender disconnect there, without ever having been taught by someone who looks like them. And, and, and what that does to black boys is dampens their aspirations. You know, what I, I read a statistic recently that if a black child has at least one black teacher by the third grade, 
they are 32% more likely to graduate from high school. Let that sink in for a moment and what that means for our Black kids in school. Black children who have at least one Black teacher by grade three is, are 32% more likely to graduate. Black boys have the lowest test scores, higher suspension rates, higher dropout and low graduation rates. That's from the Task Force on Academic Excellence and Equity way back in 2007. And we are saying we've known that this problem exists. We have talked about this problem. We've talked around the problem. We've come up with some solutions, but I think part of the problem is that we don't see the solutions as being holistic and interdisciplinary. And so we are attacking pieces of the problem without seeing it holistically. And secondly, we come up with, we come up with suggested interventions, but there, there's no accountability. There are no goals set that allow us to measure our progress. So, we, so, so our interventions, be, our recommendations become words on paper. Um, and then I, I, I want to mention the Black Progress Index, the work of the NAACP, which says that the life expectancy for Blacks is influenced by a number of factors, including college education, completion of college education, wealth, environmental and health issues. And the one that really blew my mind is growing up with a father in the home. And the mechanism by which that works is not totally clear, but we do know that boys who grew up with a father in the home adopt healthier practices like, like control of use of drugs and drinking. And, and so those things may be translating into greater life expectancy. And so that for me is an expression of the areas of overlap between, um, be, between the work of NSEED and the work of this commission. And I want to suggest some possible areas where we could focus our attention right now. And one of them has been mentioned several times today, and that is universal pre-K. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. We know that that is important. We know that that reduces violence in adult males. We know that that impacts the, the, the pre, um, going to prison. High quality pre-K education. And then I think it's important for us to work on creating a pipeline of black male teachers into the schools. That's something we could begin to work on almost immediately. How do we, funding black boys in high school, giving them a pathway into college and into teacher preparation programs so that they begin even from the high school to see teaching as a viable option, as a worthwhile career, and we induct them gradually through the high school years into teaching. teaching. Teacher preparation is one of the most expensive majors in the university. When you add together all of the praxis fees and the various things that um, the, the, the period of internship where they can't work and they must be fully um, in schools for 180 days now. And I'm saying if we can fund high school black boys and put them in a pipeline to teachers and we know the impact that that, that will have. And then I thought the, the career technical uh, training, the CCE programs, if we could get black owned businesses to partner with schools so that black boys see other black people in business, and have an opportunity to have experiences with them as part of the career training uh, program, that I think is something that is not so difficult for us to do. And then our literacy work. I've said, if I, I'm not looking at the time, so I don't know if my 18 minutes are gone, but I'm winding up now. And so I'm saying, um, we at Morgan have what we're calling the literacy brigade. We're taking some of our, our college 
black males in the summer, teaching them aspects of the science of reading and having them tutor elementary school kids. So we're getting one-on-one -on -one interactions between college boys, black college boys and elementary school children. That is having a two-way benefit. It's benefiting the, high, the college boys and it's benefiting the students in school because they are seeing black boys, black men reading and teaching them to read. That's, that's powerful. And then cultural competency, training for in-service teachers and principals. We are the, at present partnering with the Wallace Foundation to develop an, a, a pipeline of equitable focus principles. So some of these activities we think are ripe for partnership with the commission and we would like to explore those. And I began by saying that I'm hopeful that the establishment of this commission means there's recognition of the importance of this work at the highest levels of government. And, and I'm going to, I, I have to end by saying what my fears are. I have two fears. One of them is the political intrusion into schools that we are seeing now. We can't talk about race. We're working on this notion of race visible pedagogy. I'm, I'm afraid to say it out too loud in this current climate because nobody's, all this nonsense about critical race theory and that, that people are even using the term incorrectly. And so I'm saying that's one of the challenges and I'm, I'm saying things that we have to be aware of and work around. Not that they should discourage our work, but that we have to be aware of them and strategize about how to address those things. And the other one is, occurred to me just a few weeks ago in an EEO meeting here on campus when you can't say male and female because that gender identity business and the gender discrimination business. And I, so those are challenges we have to acknowledge and work around. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation later on. Dean Prime, that was enlightening, dynamite, impactful, and the work that NC looks to take on does overlap um, with the intentions of the commission in highlighting pathways uh, through education to empowerment, to improve our democracy and uplift black men and boys. Uh, and I'm really interested to see what's going to happen with the interaction uh, after you and Dr. Hutchings have uh, spoken. So thank you again so much. Um, we're gonna move right on to uh, Kathy hollowell Makel, and uh, we'll hear how uh, she is on the ground making those things that you just highlighted uh, a working reality here in the District of Columbia. Thank you, Director Spencer. And let me first and foremost say that it is a uh, delight to be invited to the table to speak about early childhood education. And let me just define, when I say early childhood education, I'm speaking about birth to eight years old, but today I'm specifically speaking about the zero to five space outside of public and charter schools or even pri private schools beyond uh, pre-K. Uh, because early childhood is part of the education continuum. And it, I'm really excited to hear Dr. Hutchings and uh, Dr. Prime uh, really highlight that we have to consider early childhood education when we're thinking about equitable outcomes for children. Um, another thing that I have uh, really excited to hear is this push for universal pre-K. And I'm also excited to share some of what has happened here in DC. I've been um, in DC education circles for about 25 years. Um, so I've seen uh, the evolution of pre-K and some unintended consequences of universal pre-K. And so um, I'm happy to share some of those experiences um, with this uh, distinguished panel and with the commissioners. 
Um, DC is a forerunner in thinking and investing in early childhood education. It uh, was one of the first municipalities to integrate Head Start in the public schools beginning in the early 70s. And in 2008, uh, the pre-K for all legislation was passed that allowed universal pre-K for all families in the district based on space and not um, income. So anyone, if there was a space available in the public school, a three and four year old, uh, parents of a three and four year old could enroll their children. And the intention of this legislation was to make sure that there was access to children, especially children, low income children, that they would have access to more seats in pre-K. And so pre-K, universal pre-K in DC has been largely uh, successful in that over 75% of three-year-olds and over 84% of four-year-olds are enrolled in some sort of uh, universal pre co program. And this includes, because it is a mixed model of uh, public and charter school, but also community-based programs that have the pre-keep um, contract with Head Start or with the federal government. And so we've been able to make sure that there are seats available. One thing that has uh, come out of uh, the, the move to universal pre-K is that Black children were not largely uh, the beneficiaries of the universal pre-K. Here, yeah, here in DC, we noticed that white children were really the beneficiaries of pre-K and it allowed, because it allowed free childcare and their mom to go back to school, their mom to their moms to go back to school and into into the workforce. So here in the District of Columbia, we specifically saw that bump of uh, white women entering the workforce when their children were able to go to pre-K three and pre-K four. Now that is not uh, a caveat to say we should not have universal pre-K. We definitely should have universal pre-K, but we have to make sure that that our children benefit and black children and children of a low social economic uh, economy or economics benefit from the universal pre-K. So out of some of the um, consequences of the universal pre-K, DC uh, decided to really focus itself, which was part of the bill in 2008, the zero to three space, and we call that early learning or early childhood uh, education space. Um, and some people just call it child care, right? But uh, largely the folks did not really understand that zero to three is part of the continuum of a child's education. I think most people understand that pre-K three and pre-K four are part of the education continuum. But to think about childcare as part of the education continuum is pretty revolutionary. So I am delighted to see that highlighted today and lifted up to understand, and especially when Dr. Hutchins mentioned that we now know that opportunity gaps and achievement gaps begins in utero because it is dependent upon the social economics of the mother. But one thing that is really positive about that is that it is recoverable if a child is given an opportunity to engage in high quality early learning. And so one thing that uh, we've learned here locally is in 2018, DC decided to put forth a bill called a pre, it's really called birth to three for all. And so birth to three for all it centers around how do we support a system to support better outcomes for children? Because I think it has been stated by these distinguished guests that we understand that education is not a silo or a vacuum. It has to also include the parent parental factors such as social economics, engagement, and so forth and so on. So one thing in the 2018 uh, Birth for All DC is we looked at First of all, how do we create better access to high quality, not just access to any early learning in zero to five, but specifically high quality uh, learning. In addition to it, how do we make this affordable? Currently, if a parent chooses to enroll their child 
in uh, a zero to three program. It is an average of $25,000 here in the district, which is largely unaffordable for moderate income families. Low income families might benefit from a subsidy which pays partial, partial tuition if the mother is working or is in school. But if the mother is not working or in school, they do not qualify for financial assistance through subsidy. So DC has now looked at how do we take those factors off of the table and provide better access for young children. And so part of what um, we've done at my organization is to advocate for affordability so that parents do not have to pay more than 10% of their income, opening up additional seats so that it is available to all children. Prior to the pandemic, uh, seats specifically for infants and toddlers were 20, 27,000 seats short. So we do not even have the uh, space and the availability for those parents who want to enroll their children in early learning programs. So we said, how do we access, how do we create more seats through grants, through uh, partnerships with public and private um, operators so that we can extend that. And then the other part is how do we support families? How do we give them wraparound services in the classroom and out of the classroom? So in addition to, uh, access and affordability. We looked at how do we help children who are maybe developmentally delayed or children who need some support around social emotional learning. But that is extended in the programs where the children attend. It works with the child, it works with the teacher, and it also works uh, with the family. And these are mental health services that are, pri that are provided through the Department of Mental Health here in the district. And then the last part is, how do we identify families that uh, might fall in these uh, categories that puts their children at risk for having some type of uh, opportunity or social economic or uh, achievement gap? And so part of what uh, those wraparound services include in this legislation of 2018 is we have home visiting that tries to identify families that need that additional support. So that's just a little bit of the background of um, what we're doing here in the district to think about how do we ensure systems that help to support kids. Now, we've certainly had some lessons and it has not all been um, uh, bundled up and packaged nicely. We know that uh, there are troubles around accessibility and we are working on making sure that all children, regardless of their zip code, I've heard that stated many times today, have access to high quality, early learning education delivered by effective, diverse, well-prepared, and a well-compensated workforce. And so when we think about how do we deliver that, my recommendations today, is to think about how do we support Black children, specifically, and Black boys on creating a system that is well-prepared to prepare them. And part of that is around equitable accessibility, thinking about lowering or assisting families in the high cost of early education, educator qualifications and credentials, and lastly, educator compensation, ensuring that equitable access to high quality early education birth to five must include public investments. Here in the district, which is certainly, rep that certainly can be replicated across the country, it is not just the job of the parent to educate the child. The city has decided to put forth public investments to make sure that all children are able to attend a early learning program that supports the child and the family through uh, investments of over $100 million. And so we think about those public investments that drive the affordability, that drive the access, 
And we also think about how that affordability improves the child care workforce as far as creating pathways for credentials, advanced education, and greater support for just greater and more competitive compensation that is on par with public schools. So I talked a little bit about uh, the quality, the cost of high quality care. The annual uh, average, as I mentioned before, is about $25,000. And that is for in-person community-based care or child care. And it's about 17,000 for home-based educators, uh, especially um, if we think about providing education where the child is. So when I speak about early childhood education, I'm speaking about center-based, but I'm also speaking about those that provide care in their home. And so we have a robust uh, at-home care or home-based educators here in the district that also provide high quality care. So when we think about those things, we wanna think about how does this impact moderate income families that are often priced out of the local market? And so when we think about that, we want to consider how do we assist families in paying for care that don't necessarily qualify for the subsidy care because the care is too great to pass that on to uh, parents, that costs on to parents. And so we wanna really consider that. One thing I found very interesting in Dr. Prime's uh, presentation is she talks about the plight in public school of attracting uh, educators of color. In childhood settings, early childhood settings in childcare, it is the opposite. Most of the work that is done in childcare is done by black and brown women. And this has uh, long implications that date back to slavery when domestic care was taken care of by the enslaved people on the plantation. And then after plantation work, uh, most black women found care as domestic workers caring for uh, children in the home. And so they were classified as babysitters and nannies and so forth. And so that long legacy has now entered into current times when we know that early childhood education is much more than babysitting. It is much more, it is much more than just watching someone's children. And it is about understanding the brain science. We now understand that brain science is critical to uh, creating meaningful interactions and experiences for children that help to close up some of those achievement gaps and opportunity gaps. We know that children who receive meaningful interactions during story time and serve and return exchanges with their teachers develop better vocabularies. They develop better understanding. And so when we think about who do we want and how do we support these women who are already in these roles caring for children? We wanna support them by creating a pathway and educational opportunities for them to increase their credentials and to increase their education. And we know that this is important because it is directly correlated between a teacher's education and a teacher's experience and the over outcomes of and the overall outcomes of children. And so we also want to think about here in the district how we've done that. In 2016, we have decided to up the credentials for those working in childcare. So now all directors in early learning programs, zero to five in community-based centers are required to have at least a bachelor's degree by December, 2022. The good news about it is that most directors, 78% as of August 20, 2022 have already achieved that, uh, that goal. It also in 2016, it was decided that assistant teachers would be required to have at least an associate's degree and that lead teachers would be required to have a bachelor's degree that taught three and four-year-olds. 
and lead teachers who teach infants and toddlers would have to have at least an associate's degree. And anyone else who serves as an assistant teacher role or as a floater would have to have a minimum of a CDA. And, and Kathy, all home-based educators will also have to have a CDA. And Kathy, let mm -hmm. me step in right here. And we're gonna give you an opportunity to expand on that. We're kind mm -hmm. of running a bit over, but we wanna oh, hear sure. those specifics about what you're doing. Um, and I apologize, we're going to uh, move on to uh, okay. and allow kind of a wrap up we've heard um, about prenatal uh, all the way through uh, high school uh, development and college intervention and teaching. We're here now from uh, the Reverend Doctor and Professor uh, James Henry Harris to kind of tie us into how all of that that you have talked about and all of our uh, presenters lead us into uh, what happens in, in terms of the overall viewpoint moving into the future for black men and boys. And so with that, uh, we'll hear from uh, Professor Harris. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, it's great to be here today. I wanna thank uh, Congresswoman um, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Hutchins, Dr. Prime, and uh, Ms. Kathy Hollowell um, Markle. And thank all of you for sharing with us today. Um, and so let me just share uh, a few things as we um, as as we uh, proceed. Um, I was born in the grip of the South, nurtured by the memory of slavery, segregation, and uh, the sign language of a blatantly racial dialectic, a South unpurged after war and a century of bloodshed. It was a hundred years after slavery and yet I felt suffering and pain while living on land that seeped with the blood of my ancestors. It is the blood that gives new meaning to the red, hill, red clay hills of Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia. The red clay dirt itself is a symbol of the evil and it conjures violent memories in which I envision the lynchings and the beatings of black boys and men, their blood spilling deep into the soil. This language, these words come from the opening paragraph of my book, No Longer Bound. I start there because recollecting one's personal history is highly correlative with the meaning of revelation. In fact, this relationship to a larger yet particular context is in fact the meaning of revelation. But more than that, our past is never past and our memory and what Toni Morrison called rememory is there to mitigate against forgetfulness on the one hand and to help point toward a future grounded in hope on the other hand. I don't have to tell you today that we have known evil on a grand scale because we have 400 years of it in our experience from the struggles of the middle passage to the current quest for freedom in all walks of life, including education, where our level of literacy is directly related to achievement and success on the positive side. Conversely, failure and the inability to read are correlated with dropout rates and significant crimes leading to incarceration. There are certainly other factors that contribute to this negativity. Black boys and men need to know that the modern era, modernity itself, began with a horrific act of terror. The first experience Africans had of modernity was one of terror, slavery, was how modernity began for them. That's what the Middle Passage was all about, a modern project in terrorism and the oppression and death of the other. So let us teach intentionally and let us educate our black men and boys about our history. Let black men and boys ground themselves in reading about the Middle Passage and develop a curriculum around this fact as a way of awakening the consciousness of our black men and boys. Black history is the methodology for pricking the consciousness of our children and youth. And I think studying, reading, and experiencing our history is foundational 
to advancing from boyhood to manhood. Encountering the living history by building into the curriculum from preschool to college, plan systematic visits to major African-American areas such as museums from Birmingham, Alabama to Washington, DC to Memphis and back again. These visuals will show and depict black suffering in ways that my words written on the page are powerless to convey. To see suffering and struggle in film in pictures and artifacts is to understand the need for freedom. The symbol, whether it's the lynching tree, the knee on the neck of a black man like George Floyd, or the murder of a child sitting on a park bench like Laquan McDonald, causes us to think the French philosopher is correct, Paul Ricoeur, in saying that the symbol gives rise to thought. Freedom, my beloved, begins with the imagination, the unbinding power of the imagination. Our slave poor foreparents imagined a world where there would be no chains and no more slaveocracy. Freedom begins with the imagination and it concretely demands a response to bondage. Black freedom has been born of dissension, not consensus because consensus, in my view, is an act of violence against, against heterogeneity and against freedom and oftentimes against truth, as many have said before me. And more importantly, people have a right to their own ideas of freedom and their ultimate freedom is to express their objection to the notion of oneness, everybody acting in lockstep with injustice and with evil. On that note, my observation is that public education is too often a project, a government project in conformity, where students are packed into classrooms or warehoused, given a prescribed curriculum, a kind of one size fit all, fits all, with teachers who are often narrowly trained and administrators who are politically appointed to promote conformity and uniformity, rather than to educate for critical thinking, which leads to liberation and leads to transformation. Now, I'm fully aware that critique is often easier than change, but effectuating uh, change is certainly a difficult and complex uh, issue and problem. But I want to say today that the line from boyhood to manhood is not linear. It's not a linear line. It's not a straight trajectory from pre-K to high school to trade school or to an apprenticeship or to college. It is a long and hard line and road full of curves and roadblocks and speed bumps. It is full of fears and doubts, full of self-doubt and external barriers to success and to survival. Urban schools are full of black children who live uh, in what some describe as ghetto housing projects, often come into school hungry, hailing from single parent families, navigating street violence and gun violence and the struggle to survive. And many of these boys are traumatized by the time they get to school. Some are hungry and others have been sexually abused by their own family members, mothers and fathers included. So I think all of this has to be taken into consideration as it relates to education. And unfortunately, uh, too often school administrators and teachers and counselors and all of those involved act as if learning and teaching are not related to physical and mental survival, socioeconomic and housing conditions. On top of that, we still have not just de facto segregation, but we still have de jure segregation implemented by government policy and law, which originated in slave codes before the Civil War and Jim Crow laws following Reconstruction. In the 1896 Supreme Court ruling Plessy versus Ferguson, the court upheld the constitutionality of segregation, mandating separate but equal schools. Let's face it, urban schools have never been equal for Blacks. So in 1917, the Supreme Court ruling in Buchanan versus Warley declared residential segregation ordinances unconstitutional but neighborhoods are still segregated because blacks are often priced out of certain neighborhoods. There are neighborhoods here in Richmond, Virginia, 
where few blacks can afford to live. And if they do, they don't send their own children to the city public schools. But as I was saying, de jure segregation was officially banned by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And today, in 2022, civil rights, voting rights, fair housing are still being attacked. Richard Rossman, in his book, The Color of Law, lays out how the government includes or advances policies that reinforce racial segregation. In other words, segregated housing ensures that schools will be segregated. Black neighborhoods are indeed underfunded, which means that schools will also be underfunded, which uh, means that the achievement gap in education is predictable based on statistical correlations between housing, schools, and race. And many of these school boards today are led by Blacks, such as those in Richmond, Virginia, and Portsmouth, Virginia, and in other urban areas throughout America, where the SOL pass rates for reading and math are abysmal. One of my former students, an English teacher in Boston Public Schools and in Portsmouth, Virginia High Schools, has done a study on his own revealing that there is a high correlation between the SOL failure rate of Black boys in three Portsmouth high schools and the increased murder rate in that city. And the elected officials and school administrators know these statistics already, and yet they continue their failed policies as they grab for even more power. This too is what I call an evil. In my book, Black Suffering, I have written two short creative nonfiction stories that speak directly to black boys and to black men in 21st century and the importance of education. One story, brothers, The Brothers of Randolph Street, chronicles the life of three black boys, Alex, Wesley, and Stoney. The ethical and literary trajectory of the story points toward the meaning and truth of growing up black and impoverished with a single mother. It's a demonstration of the theme of black suffering that resonates in the everyday lives of black boys as the face of poverty and the struggle in the home and violence in the community. Failed public schools, disinterested school boards, teachers, principals, superintendents, and other education practitioners and public policymakers nationally and locally. In the short story, in the book, Black Suffering, these boys face drugs, sex, peer pressure, and dropping out of high school as normative struggles of Black pain and suffering. The other short story depicting the journey of Black boys uh, to Black men in the 21st century is called The Prison Visit. It takes place in Greenville Correctional Facility, a death row prison in South Central Virginia, where Black males are ubiquitously present. I call the prison system a Black nation in and of itself. The main character is unnamed in the story in an effort to symbolize the dehumanizing nature of the prison system where one is assigned a number as if uh, he is quite similar to the situation that exists in Franz Kafka's short story, The Penal Colony. So again, in my, uh, in, in my book, Black Suffering and in The Prison Visit, the young man in the story is there for selling drugs and possessing weapons after dropping out of high school. Mind you, he began his education as a straight A honor student, gifted in black, and ended up with a 20 year prison sentence. Every major institution, the black church, the black community, the family and the schools had failed him in some way, however uh, undetermined that way might be. He is the unnamed main character in the story itself because he's a metaphor for the difficult jagged road from black boyhood to manhood. And while this assignment is about black boys and men, it is inescapably connected to black girls and black women who are also play a role in helping to shape the lives of black males. There can be no bifurcation of this topic if the black community is to thrive and prosper on every level, educationally and otherwise. The importance of education is incontrovertible. However, it is what constitutes this education that is of paramount importance. Like Nett Turner and Edward Goss, I was born reading, so I didn't know a time when I was not enamored by a book. But there is one thing I am sure of, and that is education has to be grounded in 
the love of self and the love of other. This is necessary for the teachers and the students and the administrators and policymakers. The love has to be instantiated in the policies and practices from the boardroom to the classroom, from the home to the school. In practice, this means that if you don't love children, you cannot, you should not, you must not be allowed to teach in a public school or to sit on a school board or to be a school administrator. Black children, boys and girls are human and must be treated with dignity and respect and love regardless of what their parents do and where they live. Every teacher, administrator and policymaker must be compelled to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paula Freire, to read Death at an Early Age by Jonathan Kozol, to read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, to read Black Suffering by yours truly. Also, there are several children's books that Blacks at all educational levels and policy levels should read. These Hands by Margaret Mason, The Story of Ruby Bridges by Robert Coles, and Henry's Freedom Box by Ellen Levine. I see my beloved brother has taken center screen and I have much more to say, but I think that's a sign and a symbol of uh, my time has ended. Well, uh, Professor Harris, eloquent as always, and we look to hear more from you uh, in the interaction with our panel. Thank you, you know, again, for an outstanding kind of global view of the challenges that we all face, but we are committed to and creating greater opportunity uh, for black men and boys, but also a reflection of trying to achieve what many people in different ways have said is the mission of the nation while being a whole nation and a democratic one based upon the rule of law and justice. Can I say one little word because that I failed to say in opening? Sure. And that is, while I thank everybody, I wanted to just do a shout out to Dr. Hutchins because he um, graduated from Old, Urban Studies from Old Dominion. Outstanding. <clears throat> and, and with that. And I'm done. Okay, the word in my ear is that we've reached the, the conclusion of our first portion. We're gonna take a short and very short intermission. And then uh, Dr. Fluker will lead us through the round table discussion. So thanks everyone, hold on, and we'll be right back with you. Thank you all, and a special thanks to uh, Chairwoman and uh, a beloved public uh, image in the life and work of Frederica Wilson, and to Mark Spencer, to you, my distinguished panelists, to other public officials and guests who are present, and to my uh, creative and long-winded colleague, uh, James Harris. God bless you. So good to see you. <laughs> I My love pleasure. your long wind because it's filled with breath. I do want to say, however, that I'm always aware that we don't have enough time. And that may be the guiding metaphor for this conversation and for our practice. We're running out of time. 
We're caught right in the middle of a perilous and precarious situation that threatens the very roots of democracy. And at the heart of that conversation is education. And the question is always education for what? I was so delighted that Dr. Hutchins, uh, no, it was Mark Spencer who mentioned Frederick Douglass uh, learning to read and write and with his great oratorical skills changed the course of the 19th century abolition movement and is still with us today. But as we began our conversation, I want you to know that Frederick Douglass was on the run. He was a runagate. He was a run away slave. And what he was running from, I think we understand, but what he was running to may be more important for our time together. He was running away from the bonded consciousness of enslavement, but he wanted to find another way to look toward the future. I was so impressed with your very astute analyses and creative proposals. So I thought I would give you a real quick thought exercise. Really, it's a metaphor. When I work with groups, especially with young Black men, I asked them to stand creatively and imaginatively at an intersection. I'm gonna ask you to do that. Find the busiest, noisiest intersection that you've ever known. And I want you to place yourself there creatively. It can be in this country, any urban center. It might be in Paris. The busiest for me was in Lagos. I've never seen so many people in one intersection. And when you get to that intersection, be aware that there's traffic coming from all directions. And there is no policeman or constable. There is no light or robot, but you're at that intersection. The first question I want you to, to, to feel your way through is what do you see at that intersection? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you know? And what will you do? The primary ethical question for us is always at this intersection, what's going on? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? What do you know? Young black men in this country are at very dangerous, noisy, political, economic, social, cultural intersections. And education may be, may be, the last institutional buffer that we have for them. This is why I admire you and your work. I'd love to think the church and the family can do that, but they don't go to church anymore. Reverend Harris will tell you that. There's some people at his church maybe, but most churches I know. Families, the abandonment of fathers, I heard Dr. Prime speak to, so much is at stake for us with civil society institutions. And for you, as we begin this conversation, I want you to be aware that nobody gets out of this intersection alone. It will always be, called, be because a community comes together. I like to say congregate, conjure, and conspire at the intersection. And that, that's what I see happening this afternoon. We're we're congregating, conjuring, and conspiring. What did you hear from your colleagues and how do you want to respond? And Mark, that will be my most valuable contribution this afternoon to engage these incredible experts, thought leaders on questions about what have you heard at the intersection from your other colleagues? 
that you find not only helpful for your own work, but may also have some problematic edges that we need to think together on. And I'm going to begin with Kathy Hollowell Mackle. All right. I think that what stands out for me is the intersection of all of our work that mm -hmm. we're doing um, and how that can certainly influence this commission on creating better outcomes for kids. I can't think about right now something that ruffles my edges, but I'm sure if I think about it, something would come up. Dr. Prime? What's going on at the intersection with you and your colleagues today? What did you hear? Yeah, what I what I heard today was the deep commitment mm -hmm. on the part of my colleagues to addressing the problem of inequity in education. In my thinking, there is no bigger problem. And its tentacles reach out into every facet of our society. Mm. And I think that if those of us who are in education, this is where I'm ruffled, if those of us who are in the field of education don't understand the important ramifications of the work that we do, we are likely to replicate the inequities. Um, I'm reading right now a book about how good intention, how in spite of in the best intentions, good schools replicate inequities. And that's what ruffles me the most. How do we really dismantle the long tradition of elitist education and the, the remnants of that that still exist even in schools that are attended by urban children? And so are we replicating, unknowingly replicating the, the inequity that we are supposed to be dismantling. Are we replicating the inequities, inequities that we are purported to be dismantling? That's what I heard. Do Dr. Hutchins, I was so impressed with you. Uh, I'm sure other people tell you that. And I, I, I wish you long life and I hope that you breathe a long time as well. And, and suffer with the people. This intersection is an intersection of life worlds and systems. These young black men come from very fragile places and they're crushed by systems at this intersection. As you were listening today and maybe would come in on now, how do you see how we negotiate and perhaps transform intersections where these young men live and breathe you know, I think that um, what comes to mind right now for me is some of my core values that I and professional values, and I call it VIP. Um, and it's not very important people, it's vision, it's integrity, and it's passion. Um, and I think that those three key characteristics is what is going to allow us to really push the envelope and to change the trajectory of our Black males, um, you know, when we're visioning, we're seeing things that we can't see today, right? It's, we're going beyond what we kind of expect. Uh, we're trying to take our Black males to places they've never been before, right? So we got to have that foresight in order to be able to do that. And when I talk about integrity, I'm thinking of the fact that, you know, we have to really do the things that we're saying we're going to do. So all the conversations we were having today, we can't just be about talk, right? We have to have action. And, um, you know, with integrity, you know, it, there's a lot of times folks will say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And when you don't do it and you're not showing up, 
uh, then you've once again failed another generation. And um, the passion is what's gonna keep us going like it has this far. You know, as, as a black race, I feel that we have been some of the most passionate, forgiving people on this planet. And if we can keep having passion to serve our black males, then we can get up every day and keep going at this war because it's beyond just an intersection. It's like a huge train wreck that's happening um, right before our eyes. And if we don't do something, mm -hmm. um, we're going to literally fail every single one of our black children, which in turn will fail this nation. I thank you for your uh, uh, stress on courageous leadership, which I identify with the passion that you name and it's important that it be grounded with integrity and with vision. As I transition to uh, Dr. Harris, I want you to hold that thought because I think it's a very important one. What is courage? What does that really look like in the 21st century with impending democratic elections that will determine in many ways, not just the fate of education, but the future of this democracy? What might courageous leadership look like? Dr. Harris, you, you talked about memory, one of my favorite subjects, as you well know. And I'm interested very much in how memory, and I'm also pointing back to Dr. Hutchins, how memory, vision, and mission are related. I don't think you can have a vision without memory. It's a very dangerous thing to wake up. In fact, it's a fantasy to have a vision without long memory. And so how would you begin to engage this conversation out of your own work and also as a as hopefully wisdom for these incredible educators who are here, researchers, thinkers who need vision, who are pointing to the loss of memory and the radical erasure of memory that is politicized? How do you begin to move into that space? Thank you, Dr. Fluker. That's a great uh, that's a great question, and I I'm thinking that um, I used to sit in I used to sit in graduate school. I remember at you know at the University of Virginia, looking out the window at a statue of Thomas Jefferson, and um, I have said in school or in class uh, from time to time, you know, the, um, somebody might call on me, the professor might call on me, and I say something like, uh, I remember when I was a slave. And the whole class would uh, like perk up and like, you know, has has what is Harris talking about? Um, but you know, in in my um, in in my view or in my construction of uh, of interpretation and that kind of thing, I think that we we really do have to um, reflect upon um, deeply you know, on a, a memory that in many cases we have lost or lost because um, either uh, intentionally or it has been uh, extirpated from our consciousness um, either by, a, a, by the Slovakracy or uh, some other form of evil um, and, and so forth. So I'm very much um, trying, that's why I made some a lot of references, uh, you know, to slavery and the evils of slavery and that kind of thing. These are things that we must not forget. I think that they must be inculcated in the curriculum. And, um, you know, as I have said, additionally, I think that this notion of, uh, of, of love that I, um, that I glossed over, I think that also has to be, um, you know, a part of, 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 of black life, I often talk about black black love, and I and I and I, I'm I'm I, I reiterate the notion that you know, as black people, we have to we have to love our black children, mm. and we have to show them that love, um, you know, every time we have an opportunity, and every time every time we can. I didn't, what I didn't get to say was my oldest son, um, when he was in middle school, I had to take him out of middle school 
Uh, he was in a public school, a middle school, where he was having extraordinary fun. Uh, it took one semester for his grades to just plummet. So I had to take him out and I put him in a, a predominantly white school and it pained him to no end. And um, I remember I had, you know, I had paid the tuition because you had to pay the tuition in advance. But he came home one day and he said, you know, dad, I, I, I can't go back to that school. Now, we, I, he was in middle school and I, I'm a proponent of public education. And I have been marching and arguing and writing about education for years. And at the same time, my own son comes back and said, says that he didn't want to go back to that school, that if he had to go back to that school, it was an ultimatum to me, though. You know, and as a father, I, it, it took a lot of whatever for me to just accept that. But he said, if I have to go back to that school, I'm going to drop out of school because I don't want to go back. And I, you know, I thought about that and, and thought about that. And he, he went back to the, the, the school that he came from, where he apparently felt, um, you know, more love and other kinds of things. And I wanted I was much more concerned about my son's mental and physical health than I was about keeping him in a, in a school to. Uh, where I thought might improve his uh, his uh, SOL scores and other kinds of things, but I think that you know that we as a that we can never forget. That's that's the my major point to 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 address your question. We can never forget, and we like we like to forget in many ways. We uh, you know we like uh, one other example, and I'll I'll move on. But we like to forget even about our suffering and struggles and pain, because I say in my book, Black Suffering. Uh, that one one Sunday I was preaching about this and a lady and her daughter got up and walked out in the middle of my sermon. And then she wrote me a long email the next day saying she was tired of hearing about black suffering. And every time she comes to church, I'm talking about uh, oppression and injustice and slavery and that kind of thing. And she she just didn't want to hear about that anymore. And I'm saying that's a reality, I think, in our in 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 in, in our lives, in black life, that that the trauma is so great. That a lot of times people like to escape, and they and and from a a, a a religious perspective, they you know they escape into conservative evangelicalism and other kinds of things. Yeah, I'm 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 glad you mentioned that, and as part of the ongoing conversation, and this this is open. I don't have a a button. I guess you don't have a button where you can raise your hand and come in. So I'll just call on people if you don't mind. But. Uh, Mark didn't mention when he first introduced me that I spent 13 years of my academic career at Morehouse College. I helped to found the uh, Andrew Young Center, which is now on global leadership. But early on, uh, in one of our pre-college programs, we would intentionally identify and recruit young men from different parts of the country who might not have an opportunity to come to even Morehouse. And it was, a, it, was, it was major. But let me tell you what I discovered. Meeting these young men, there were two major issues that were there. And I'm addressing the question of trauma, uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, trauma, traumatized memory, dangerous memories, uh, they habituate, they, they stay with us over time and they're intergenerational. So the young men, when they would talk or speak their truth, the first and the most devastating issue for them was the sense of abandonment, mainly by their fathers. Mm. When I would hear it, all I could do was hold back tears, but they felt, now, Keep in mind that there are systems, and many of those fathers might be incarcerated. There are all kinds of reasons for the absence of father, but this was a number one issue. The second issue surprised me, uh, Dr. Grimes. It surprised me because it's something that we don't want to hear and that we don't want to feel. Most were asking questions about their sexuality. I'm not suggesting that those two issues are related, but I am suggesting that they speak to the heart of the kinds of issues that educators must be aware of, and I'm sure most of you are, when these young men come into our spaces and we must provide ways in which they can become aware not only of their internal environments, but also the ways in which they are structured by larger environments. 
I do want to turn to uh, Dr. Grimes here and uh, get a comment and move on to, I'm trying to remember all of the names, uh, Hollowell, uh, Dr. Hollowell Mackle. Yes, um, that is one of, I mentioned one of the challenges that we face in addressing the specific needs of black men and boys. Um, we know that as a demographic, they are at great risk um, socially, health-wise, economically. But I worry about the prevailing climate in which it has almost become um, anathema for us to talk about gender as a binary, almost in any other way. I will confess, I, a young man came to my office here at Morgan um, not too long ago and by his dress, he was saying that he rejects the binary notions of gender. And um, how does an organization, how does this commission that's explicitly saying black men and boys, and I heard the Congresswoman uh, mention that we can do this unapologetically, but I am not sure how we navigate those waters. Um, and, and I really want you know, to hear what my colleagues think about that because it's something that I am struggling with. Dr. Hollowell Mackle, thank you very much. Yeah, it, um, Dr. Prime's uh, comments reminds me about that we are so entrenched in culture, culturally responsive teaching and being very um, uh, sensitive to that. But we don't necessarily think about the uniqueness of young black boys mm. and how they are different from their white counterparts mm. and how they are different from girls. Uh, my background is I was a teacher for many, many years, whereas girls are much more social and they want to be included and they want to have conversations. You know, the boys, they have their own way of communicating and being. And I know that as a classroom teacher, and I also know that as the mother of two boys, mm -hmm. I've shared this story before that when my child was in kindergarten, he is now at Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. But when he was in kindergarten, um, his teacher, first parent conference, she told me that my child didn't color in the lines. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to her, he's not a coloring in the line kind of kid. Mm -hmm. He's a jumping, skipping, hopping, running on, rolling on the floor kind of kid. And I felt like that there was not an understanding that his modality of just being was totally different than what she was accustomed to. And so I think about when we think about elevating young black boys in just in, in being comfortable, however they identify and who we are, that we have to realize that they are not monolithic, that mm -hmm. they are their own individual selves. And how do we hold them up to where they feel comfortable to present themselves in the world as they are. And that starts, and that starts with education being accepted education. and understood um, from the day that they walk into spaces outside of their home, because children will learn wherever they are. So, so this question of identity, I think, is related also to the other, right? At this intersection where worlds are colliding, life worlds and systems that set up certain people, especially young black males for vulnerabilities, for life chances, chances that are diminished, et cetera, things that we know. At this intersection where identity is related to the other, what is it that is really going on in the classroom, and, and, and I'm turning to Dr. Hutchins. What is going on in the classroom with this kind of cultural gaze that says identity has to be construed one way? And I'm not just talking about sexuality. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about different ways of learning, mm -hmm. different ways of being, mm -hmm. 
different ways of knowing. What is this cultural gaze that we are always trying to mirror? I think it's responsible for a lot of the deep problems we have still with bourgeois acquisition among many of the leaders that we are asking to mentor our, our young. We, we, everybody is not a good mentor. Mentors need training and education as much as the students sometimes. But, but there's a cultural gaze that sets us up and is highly problematic. I thought I heard you speaking to that. Uh, earlier, Dr. Hutchins. So I'm addressing that to you. Well, you know, um, just going by what just came to mind as you were talking. And I think that uh, this right now is a time I'm thinking about the pandemic, right? It has allowed us to, it put us all in a space that none of us had ever been before. We had to pivot and just change how we operated. Um, I look at this as an opportunity now for us to really reimagine how we serve children, period. Um, I feel that we can go into a space now where we can reimagine how we assess, we can reimagine how we teach, we can reimagine what the dynamic of a school or a school building is. Um, and this is the opportune time to do it because everybody's, you know, that I'm sure people read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Everybody's cheese has been moved, right? <laughs> We've all been put in a place where nobody ever thought that you would be home with your family all day and talking to people or being on a Zoom like we are right now. That, nobody even knew what Zoom was three years ago. Um, well, many people didn't know what it was. Uh, so I, what, what I'm thinking to, just to answer your question is that we just need to reimagine how we serve. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a huge opportunity now with uh, just in regards to identity and not just sexual identity, but identity in general. Mm -hmm. We just need to start accepting folks for who they are and not what we want them to be. And that's a hard thing for many people to do, right? We have been indoctrinated, whether it's the church, <laughs> whether it's our households, whether it's you know our friend circles, whether it's the media, whether it's television um, and social media now, uh, we need to stop putting folks in boxes and meeting them where they are, not necessarily where we want them to be. Mm -hmm. And the moment we can start doing that, and this is something I'm not trying to push church on anybody. I'm just speaking from what I know my pastor at Alpha Street Baptist Church in Alexandria talks about often is who are we to judge? You know, um, and when we talk about, you know, and I'm speaking Christianity just for me, um, you know, Jesus didn't judge people. So who gives us the right to do that? Uh, and I feel like we have to we have to bring that philosophy. I'm not speaking of Christianity into the schools. We bring that philosophy of not judging uh, folks and accepting them for who they are. Is Dr. Going Fluker, if I could take this moment. And just interrupt, sorry, I apologize, Dr. Hutchings. Uh, two of our uh, commissioners, it seems, want to weigh in. And I would ask you to uh, acknowledge uh, Commissioner Marshall and Commissioner Oleka if they want to weigh in at this point. Thank you. I'd be honored. I'll begin. Thank you uh, for all the presentations. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, I believe you can hear me. I let me just say, when you spoke of intersections, Dr. Fluker, yes, uh, I thought of street corners because that's what <laughs> I see. Those are the intersections I see. And all of these young men are out on these street corners. And the first thing I want to say about these street corners, and because I work with all of them on a daily basis, is they may act like they know what, that they have it together, but they're really saying, help me navigate help me navigate. Even though it looks like I got it all together, I don't. And that's the one thing I just want to say to everybody. When you see those street corners, no matter how they act, how much swag they may appear to have, they are asking for help in navigating those corners. And obviously, they're not, many of them are doing well because they end up in places that that's why we have these commissioners, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I got to say that the one thing I heard, and I, and I continue, continue this big thing is, History and culture is so important. I mean, history and culture is it's incredibly important. And the phrase I use with my young men is, is that uh, we collude in our own oppression. And, mm -hmm. and 
the one thing that I have seen that can can sort of look there's there's a reason that when guys in prison discover their history and their culture that they begin to say well, I was hoodwinked and bamboozled right <laughs> even though they may be in there for years so if I was make anything mandatory and I, again I say this because when the young people come to me and they say they didn't teach any of this in schools they say that all the time first thing uh, and then they why why didn't they teach us this in school? So I'm gonna, if I was making a recommendation, a mandate, history and culture, and, and that's the reason that is now so much under attack. And people know what they're doing, right? They don't want you to teach that. They don't want you to teach it. I wanna put in a, 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 a plea, no way. There's a, there is a group of young men out there who are really doing well doing good, doing well, and they feel there's something wrong with them doing well. <laughs> and if you put a bunch of them in, in a room together, um, uh, and I have, they think they're, they're labels, you know, they're squares or they're nerds or they're acting white or all of this stuff. And they'll be in a room with others and they will be, be they're afraid to show their leadership. They're afraid to say, I'm okay, I'm fine. There's a whole bunch of that. Because I know I was one of those kids. I was great. I was fine. But I thought there was something wrong with me because I was okay. And I think the one thing that can help fortify them is, is history and culture. Uh, but I think we need to support them as much as all the others. I, I want to say that, that there is a whole group of young men out there who are fine. And they really do are afraid to use their voices because they think, you know, they're the nerds or the squares. Uh, look at hip hop, and I'll give you that one example. Um, who's my favorite rapper? God, I forgot his name. Anyway, he, he, he's conscious and he's being shouted down by all those who aren't conscious. But he, because he is conscious, he's not afraid. Kendrick Lamar, he's my guy, right? Who's not afraid to speak. So there's, I wanna put a plug in for that group that's out there. And, and once they get their voice, they will actually be able to help those who are going on a different path because they're not afraid to stand on what they know is the right thing to do. I want to make a big plug for that group. An excellent Thank you. recommendation. Thank uh, you, Commissioner. Um, apologies, uh, Dr. Fluker. We are, um, the voice in my ear say we are running down to the end of time. This has just been so great. Uh, I want to uh, ask uh, Commissioner Oleka if he would make brief comments and then uh, we will come to the end and wrap. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, I, I wrote the question because I want to make sure I get the language here right. But first, I want to say I, I, I appreciate the discussion. I do want to try to differentiate, though, between uh, intellectual exploitation and intellectual enrichment. So my specific question is, how do we differentiate between intellectual exploitation and intellectual enrichment in education? The example I've given here, I don't consider telling a seven-year-old black boy that he is a descendant of slaves and should therefore distrust and dismiss his country, America, or white people in general as intellectual enrichment. I don't think anybody is saying that here, but I have heard that said in different conversations that I've been in. I consider that exploitation, epistemological conditioning. But explaining to a seven-year-old black boy that an overreaching government can take away his liberties, his humanity even, as evidenced by the system of chattel slavery and Jim Crow is in fact intellectual enrichment. It places the skepticism on a set of systems rather than a group of people or his own country. In our education systems, I think that it's important that we that we make a distinction between those two. So my question, uh, or I guess my comment if we're out of time, is how can we do a better job of that? Because I think that's key in this conversation for black boys uh, and men intellectually in education. Thank you. I don't know if I'm supposed to come in. Mark, how's my time? I'm ready to do what you tell me to do. I can only say I agree. And that I think part of the issue at stake is to begin to understand how systems, both structure and internally structure uh, behaviors. And so when you're caricatured as mad men, monkeys and monsters, and you see that image as the only image that you see, you need the intellectual equipment to engage those images. And education 
That's part of its work. That's what you mean by intellectual enrichment. Because the system does exist, there is a long history of it existing, but it does not mean that you need to in any way demean the other as unworthy of the respect and the recognition that you seek for yourself. And with that, I'm going to thank uh, Dr. Fluker for doing such an outstanding job of moderating this panel discussion. You know, I'm all excited and I'd love to carry on for another couple of hours. Um, I would invite uh, all of the participants if you'd like to carry it on. And I hope that we've created uh, some new uh, relationships and links that you can further uh, expand on. I know I'll be looking to do that. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Oleka. Your comments will be the last that uh, we'll have for uh, this afternoon session. Um, again, this is my first opportunity to uh, preside at uh, a quarterly meeting. Uh, it's been really great, exciting. Each of you has given us much to think about. Uh, and here at the commission, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of work to do to catch up with the expertise and the vision that you've given us, but we will attempt to do that. Um, thanks to each of you and all of the commissioners for your participation. And again, Dr. Fluker, uh, great thanks uh, for your uh, erudite uh, ability in engaging this discussion. And I'd like to, to see it continue in some form. So that is unfortunately it for us, for the time that we had, um, we are at the end. Uh, the next portion uh, will be our very brief business uh, meeting wrap up. So thanks to each of you. And um, we'll be following up with uh, our experts and participants. And again, great thanks and Godspeed to each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. As for uh, trying to catch up, uh, the chair is not available to us. Um, she had to step away on serious matter. Um, we are at the close of the quarterly meeting, uh, the first quarterly meeting for 2023. And I wanna thank each of you uh, for participating and allowing us to uh, reach a quorum. Um, the only business that uh, I want to conclude uh, in this space uh, 
uh, without the chairwoman uh, is to ask um, if you have been provided and approved of the minutes of your last meeting. And if so, uh, please uh, acknowledge that uh, you approve of those minutes by saying yes or raising your hand and that will be sufficient. Is there any objection uh, to the approval of the minutes from the last meeting of your commission? Okay, and with that, I'll take that as an approval. Um, and the last uh, point of business for today uh, without the chairwoman is I'll ask um, if you agree uh, that we will conclude this meeting uh, with your permission and then we will follow up uh, with the other elements of the business portion by email to you through uh, the chairwoman for your approval. Uh, is there anyone who is opposed to that motion? All right, I take that as an approval uh, of our um, uh, request that we close uh, the business portion uh, of the meeting. I hope that uh, we presented um, speakers uh, and covered a topic in a meaningful way for each of you. Uh, we will create a link to today's uh, meeting um, and you'll be able to also uh, see the bi biographies and also links to the advocacy and scholarly work of each one of uh, our participants today. Uh, and with that, that's a wrap, that's it for me. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. Uh, we look forward uh, to working with you uh, in the coming uh, months and year uh, as we try to improve uh, on our work to highlight uh, what you ask us. And, and I would just take this moment, we uh, continue to reach out to each of you so that we can hear back from you and engage you on what those important issues related to black men and boys are. Uh, so please feel free and do uh, respond to our survey, but at any time, send us your concerns, your comments, uh, but also your suggestions about uh, your particular uh, area of subject matter for your subcommittee so that going forward, we are uh, including and highlighting those things that you recommend to us uh, as work to be done. So with that, uh, that is the end of uh, this meeting. I thank you much. Godspeed to you. Safe travels wherever you are. Uh, Commissioner Dillard, uh, we know that you're three hours behind us, but we wish you a satisfactory day. Thank you so much to each of you. And that's it for me. Uh, the National Press Club, I guess, will close us out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tina. Thank you so much. Thanks for holding my hand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, <laughs> and you have a very impromptu. <laughs>